please welcome the multi-talented visionary composer, performer, and storyteller, David Arkenstone. <laughs> Thanks for Thank you. Here. Yeah, excited to have you here. I was wondering who you were talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, I, wonder, I wanted to start with Winter Lead. You know, a lot of artists are encouraged to make Christmas albums, which this is not. And I'm just wondering, you know, for you, what was the genesis? And then how did you think, okay, how do I approach this? Uh, being from mostly from California, uh, my memories of winter go back to when I was a kid outside of Chicago, and it was all fun and games then, sledding, you know, all the snow angels, and then, you know, we didn't have to drive, we didn't have to shovel, you know, all the good things about winter. But I, I feel like the impetus was the moment when there's a snow falling, and it's just silent. It's just silent around you, like especially if you're in a forest or something, there's extra acoustic cushion, I guess. So I've been thinking about doing a winter record for about three or four years, and then it just became the right time. We did some touring in Colorado, and I was again near the snow, and it was like, oh, man, this maybe this is the time. So that's how it came about. And when you, when you start, how, does, how do you begin with that? I s probably explore sounds, different sounds that would say winter to me, you know, um, kind of textural sounds or a certain kind of piano sound. Uh, just s just start <laughs> throwing paint at the wall, kind of, you know, because uh, the sounds are inspirational, you know, whether the melody's there yet or not, uh, a lot of times it's not, and you're just making a texture, uh, so it kind of grows from there, and then you know, pretty soon you have 20 songs, maybe, and then you've got to say, okay, I can only really use 10 or 12. So. And for this album, like how, how long was that process of writing those 20 songs to get to your 10? <laughs> when I concentrated, it probably took me three months to do, to do it all because I didn't want them all to just be a certain kind of song. You know, I wanted to, because winter has different things to it. There's storms, the snow falling, a creek, you know, uh, babbling sort of in between the ice. Uh, so I wanted to try to, uh, it really was a lot like painting. Do you, I'm curious, because, you know, your titles are very, The Icy Brook Finds Its Way, Kisses from the Falling Snow. Do those come later? Where do those come along in the process? Because to me, you have a, such a strong sense of narrative in your work. And I'm just curious as a storyteller, like, where, where, do, where does that piece come into it, the title? I'd say half and half. Sometimes I think I get a vision of a piece and I try to illustrate it through music, you know, sort of an impressionistic approach. Uh, and then sometimes I just like the feel of it, and I don't even know what it's going to be called until it's time to have to print it. <laughs> and, I mean, and you're... It can't you're be called Winterlude Number 5, right. which is, that's the way it starts. <laughs> <laughs> and as a multi-instrumentalist, when you start that process of sitting down... Do you reach for whatever's nearby? Is it keyboard, guitar? Like, where do you start? Does it vary? It varies. Like, some albums start with drums, which there's very little of on Winterlude. Uh, so it was a lot of keyboard sounds. You know, I have every sound that you could possibly want in my computer. And so it becomes very important to establish the palette, I think. So I'm not all over the map. I learned that a long time ago because I, well, my first record, it was like, oh, I can put this. It's like they're not, you know, like that doesn't fit, you know. It's just too disparate. So um, mostly it's keyboard. Sometimes it's a, it's a guitar, you know, a very ambient sort of guitar thing. And I'm, I'm curious, like, for you, you, at some point you've talked about how technology has produced these amazing tools for making music. Like, how do you use, how does technology serve you in terms of your creativity? And what do you use? What do you, when you're working? Like tool-wise? Uh, I do everything in Pro Tools, Avid Pro Tools, because it's just easy for me. Then when we go to the studio to mix it, everybody has Pro Tools. Uh, early on, I had different sequencers, and when uh, 
I always say when computers and synthesizers started to communicate, that was a wonderful thing to, w to witness because all of a sudden I could do eight different things and now I can do like 60 different things and, and pick and choose, you know. Um, so that's, that's my main tool, I think. And you just do one track and then you do another track and then they work or they don't work. You know, you shut one off and try something else. You know, I still, I still, I still like making left turns in the middle of songs. And I don't know what, whether I get bored or not, but I just, you know, it's like I gotta have some kind of bridge, you know, before I go back. It just can't be one thing all the way. And I would, I noticed that in a lot of my music recently. It's like, oh yeah, because I'm just working on a new record, and it's like, oh yeah, I hope I have a bunch of left turns in there already. So it's kind of fun. And I'm curious with when you, that discovery of technology for you, did that happen in a, a point in your career? Did it make a huge difference? Like, wait, I could so expand my sonic palette. Yeah, it made a huge, it was a, it was a musically, a musical life changer, I would say. Because my first record came out in uh, 1987, and that was right around the time that I had a Commodore, and I could make eight tracks, <laughs> and I had three synthesizers, but on the track, you looked at the little window, and it was either lit or not lit, and so you knew something was on that track, and it was all <laughs> there was. <laughs> so it was, it was challenging, but it was the right moment. I mean, years before that, I, I, you know, I mean, I didn't have the wherewithal to just hire a bunch of people to, to play my parts, so I had to do it myself, at least at the beginning. And I'm related to that. I'm curious when you were in a band, and you know, you had a prog rock band at some point, and I'm wondering if it <laughs> kind of felt like I, I have so much more that I'm hearing that I'm not, you know, able to do with this band, and I, I want to have this much broader palette. Is, is that's that how it happened? That's pretty exactly how it happened. Plus, I had two small kids, and you know, that makes you think a certain way. And then, yet another lead singer flaked, and. And that was like, you know, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this path, you know, and it, it worked out. You know, it was, like I said, you know, I could have eight tracks, all of a sudden I could have 16. We went in the studio, the first couple albums, we had two 24 track tapes synced together, so it was like a playground, you know, wow. You know, it was almost too much to choose from. And were, were there any particular albums or, or artists where you thought, wait, that's, that's actually the direction I want to go? Well, I remember hearing a Kitaro record one time. And, and to me, at the time, that sounded like Pink Floyd without the words and the lyrics. And, and I thought, wow, instrumental music can be so much, you know. I mean, I loved Peter Gabriel, but I don't sing like that, although I have wished for that. Uh, I just don't have that voice, no matter what I do. Um, so then I started listening to different instrumental albums, and I had already li listened to a lots of classical music growing up, but uh, and I really loved the Impressionists. So uh, that was an area I tried to take the the uh, my music. I'm just thinking of you growing up. You mentioned the Nutcracker being sort of formative for you, and <coughs> again, I'm wondering, like that moment, can you talk about like seeing that? I remember being four, maybe four years old, and and I tell the story <laughs> when we go on tour at Christmas time or holiday time. I would play the Arabian dance over and over again, lift the needle up on my little Disney record player, you know, whatever it was. My mom was like, "Wow." And that was the moment that I, I know that I wanted to find out what that was. What, what makes that sound? You know, I didn't know if it was people. I didn't know what it was, you know, a four or a five maybe. And then I started taking piano lessons when I was seven and it's like, oh, it starts here, you know, chopsticks or whatever, you know. The Volga Boatman was another popular one. Um, and, and, and that planted the seed and then of course, the Beatles came out, and then Jethro Tull, and then it was like, oh, uh, now I think I want to be a rock musician. <laughs> so I tried that for a long time. And were your and parents musical? 
And my mom was a singer and played piano incredibly well. And my dad was a guitar player, and uh, he could sing too, but he was a, like a jazz guitar player. And I remember when I, when I was really small, I remember sliding up and down the guitar case that was in the closet. <laughs> but uh, when I got to say, oh, I want to play guitar now, he's like, oh, you know, I said, can you show me some stuff? And he was like light years, like he couldn't, he couldn't show me how to start. Because he was just totally played by ear, and it was unreal. It was like, wait a minute. And then, unfortunately, when I started to learn guitar, Are You Experienced came out. And it was like, I, I think maybe I should give up this guitar <laughs> thing. But I didn't. But I didn't. It was inspirational. I mean, for everybody who, who knows Jimi Hendrix, it was like, what? What? what yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and I'm curious for your parents, being musicians, did, I'm sure they encouraged you as a, as a kid, but when you said, hey, I, I, I really want to pursue this professionally, hesitant? <laughs> like, what was their response? Well, my Good dad, luck? My dad was, was less a fan of that than my mom was, I think. My mom was just like, everything I did, all, all five of us, I have four brothers, and everything we did was just terrific, golden. <laughs> and my dad was like, because he had been in bands, and he had a more of an idea of what it would take, I think. He had a better understanding of that. And so, uh, not that he wasn't encouraging. I remember them being, I mean, I was, I, we played crazy music loud. And I remember them coming and bringing my two little brothers. And it's just, they were very supportive, you know, I think. And we, we practiced in the garage so that, you know, they couldn't have been too against it. <laughs> and at, at what point, I'm curious, did video games come into it? First of all, did you play video games? Uh, I did early, you know, uh, early on we had an Atari yeah. and uh, played some games on that, uh, like Centipede. <laughs> Centipede. Centipede was really cool. Uh, but I didn't get into the, the heavy, heavy RPGs and stuff like that. Because uh, it would it takes away from music. I mean, if you're a gamer, it like Warcraft. Pe some of those people just play like every waking moment. There goes your practice time. Yeah, yeah. And there goes your yeah. You're not going to get any better anymore. That's where, however good you are. That's it. Because you play games now. But who was the first video game company to go? This is our guy. It was because a company. It does feel like you know it. It was perfect. It was a company called Westwood in. Uh, Las Vegas, and they made this game called Lands of Lore and a couple other games. And I remember when the internet first started, 96 or 97 around there, there was hardly anything on there, but there was a job board on there. And they had a board, and, I, and so I just put my name in the hat, and like a year later, a FedEx package landed on my, it's like, they didn't call, nothing. I mean, I could have <laughs> moved, I could have been back in Chicago, but, uh, the, the music director uh, said, you know, they wanted to try having some music for their game. And some guys, some of the people in the office were fans, because I had done several records before that, and it infiltrated, you know. So I was only too happy to jump in that world, because it's a world where, unless you're doing like a cinematic that's tied to time code, it's, fr it's like freedom. You are painting what you want the uh, player to experience as well as the game. You know, it's like the, it's like the backdrop, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's really important, actually, uh, beyond the shooting and the fighting in some games. Yeah, it's setting so much of the mood. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, and that's what I like about the world of Warcraft is that there's a lot of that sort of wandering around exploration, and that was perfect for me. And like that first time out, like what, what were the challenges of doing it? Uh, Did they give you a creative brief, or was it yeah, just like, mm, right? A, a little bit of a brief, yeah. you know. First of all, they said, just just do something, you know. And then I did something, and then at least you then have something to talk about. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, that's too this, that's too that. We like that part. We like that 10 seconds, you know, whatever it was. It wasn't that minuscule, but uh, it was more like, you know, they, they coached, you know. They knew more about what the game was going to be like 
inside the game. Whereas I, I, didn't, I looked at, like, uh, which I still do, just look at art and fly-throughs. That's all I'd get. And for you, creatively, like, how does that work, you know, um, both inspire and how is it different than do your own work? Say you're doing an album, like, how do you, in your approach to it? Well, in, in some ways it's easier because you're, you're given some visual stimulus and, and that's a good place to start. And then you, you think, okay, this instrument is not going to work for this scene, you know, this atmosphere. So it's again choosing that palette, which, which starts, the, starts the wheels turning. It's like, oh, I can use clarinet and uh, the orchestra or whatever, or that, that character or that race has this kind of feel. And uh, it's, it's getting the palette that's really inspirational to me, you know, trying to figure out what not to use because you can use anything because it's right there in front of you. And when you do that work, I'm just thinking of the quote by Randy Newman. He was saying, you know, when he does his own albums, he'll write a song and then think, shit, I wrote that in 1970, you know. But he said, I've, he said, I've never had that experience with the film. I, they show me a scene, I immediately can think of what could go with that. Um, I'm wondering for you, does, do you find it's, it's work you immediately take to when you've got something new in front of you? Like, oh, I've got ideas for that. Instantly. Yeah, it's like, they say, oh, we have an assignment for you. It's like, I just can't wait. And then you get some JPEGs and then a little fly through. And it's like, yeah, I just start throwing that musical paint against the wall. And, and then I play it against the little movie, and then I give it to them, and they vote on it. <laughs> and I'm curious, like, for the people who've come to your work through that, like when you talk to those fans, what, what, are their, what do they say to you? They go back to places where that music lives in the game just to hear it sometimes, which is like, oh, my gosh. Really? Like... For in, in, for example, World of Warcraft, I did an album of tavern music for all the different taverns. And a lot of people go there just to relax after they've just been in like a huge battle or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they go there and it becomes, it becomes part of their experience. And that's just like so gratifying, you know. Um, can we just, I'd like to talk about your creative process and just, you know, how that might vary by projects. So with personal work, um, how will that, how does, you know, and you're so prolific. I'm just curious, as you take on new projects or you think about new projects, what is it that sparks that sense of drive, both the ambition of it, but also the, the creative flow? Um, well, I used to say it's just a habit to make records. You know, it's just like, okay, one's done, what's next? But, uh, you know, the record business has changed a lot. So I have to really be passionate about what I'm working on. And I'm, I'm working on a new thing now, and it's, it's just got me, I just love it. Um, so I think that uh, I just latch on to something, and then it just drives me, and then I can't wait to get up in the morning and see what's going to happen. And is that when you say latch on to something, is it something you hear in your head or something that gives you an idea? What is it? Yeah, it could be an idea. It could be an idea. It could be a part of a book. It could be a movie or nothing <coughs> or nature, you know, or, or just things that I've had in my head for years that all of a sudden they trickle to the top. It's like, oh, cause like with, it, with Winterlude, it was, you know, I've thought about that for years, doing a winter album, a non-holiday winter album um, and so they they trickle up and and uh, then they become important like really important almost obsessively important <laughs> because it takes it takes so much for creation I mean the way I do it you know I just don't want to I have to be passionate about it and because I kind of make music that I would want to listen to and I think that's a high bar for myself because uh, I have to start there, though. Um, because if you if I don't, I don't think people would be interested so much because I get a lot of feedback from fans, and they are interested. You've talked about Tolkien being 
that been the source of inspiration and you've done music around that's been inspired by his work. And I'm curious, are there, for Tolkien in particular, that was something clearly, read it at the right age, very powerful. Um, when you first did that, had you been thinking of that when you did the first album, Inspired by Middle Earth, had you been thinking about that for years? In a way, because I, I did an album, uh, like before I did that album, called In the Wake of the Wind, and, and it had a map, it had a story, it had, you know, it was like my own version of an adventure in a, in a distant land. And uh, by the time I did the first music inspired by Middle Earth, I had done a couple of those kind of adventure kind of things, which I thought was so cool that a record company would allow me to do something nutty and expensive. <laughs> And what are the, what's the role, if any, of deadlines? I, I asked because I have a musician who lives in the ADU behind us, and he was saying he has no deadlines, and, and he's, you know, he said, I'm not finishing anything. What, what's the role of deadlines for you, if, it, if any? When you're working with, on a game or something, you have a deadline. You know, they say, okay, th the orchestra date is set, period. So then you got to back up. Orchestrator has got to have it a week, two weeks ahead of time. You know, that's one thing. And, and w give us an example of, like, how much time you might have in that a particular case. You know, weeks, month and a half, maybe, if you're lucky. B but, like, currently, I finish one piece, and I go, okay, here's another, you know, here's another. It's like, wait a minute, you know, we're getting closer to April, you know, 7th or whatever it is. It's like, but I can do it, luckily. I'm not, I, I don't have a shortage of... I mean, can't wait to do it, you know. I'm excited to do it. For my own work, I just have to set a deadline. I mean, otherwise it, I would never finish it. Because when I'm, when I'm working on a record like this new one that I'm working on, I listen to it all the time. And it's like, oh, I gotta change this info, infinite little thing nobody will ever hear. And uh, I do that up until the time it has to go to the mix. And do you have people who are other pairs of ears for you that you go, hey, I, I'm really close to this. I'd love to have somebody who's not so close. Or no, do you have... You I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I've, I've real... I mean, I, I play it for people. And, you know, usually the people I play for is like, oh, that's really great. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> it so you it let can be helpful. Reinforcement. Yeah, I have that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I have to be... You know, that's what's nice about making your own records. Like, you're the director, you know. It's like, I love having other musicians contribute, but they do their part. They don't say, oh, I didn't like playing on that song, you know. Uh, so, no, I just, I have to be the, I have to be the one, the end of the road. I'm curious, you know, you're going to play live tonight, and oh, yeah. is playing live for you a way to have that give and take of playing with others? Because it sounds like most of your work, you... You're creating all the parts yourself. But I'm wondering, for playing live, it's like, all right, good to be back with other musicians, the give and take of that, the paying attention to each other. I'm, I'm, what, for you, live performance, what does that bring out of you? I'll tell you what, it wouldn't be me sitting here alone. I would never do that. It's, it just wouldn't be fun. It'd be terrifying. I don't care how many keyboards are around me. <laughs> uh, it, it just, it just, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in this, I'm interested in this, you know, otherwise it's, it's, it's not interesting to me. Um, these guys, okay, here's the, here's the part, here's the song, but then they take it somewhere you didn't, never would imagine, you know, and that's really fun for me. You know, the, the uh, sharing, you know, the, the growth of a piece that was on a record, and it was like, okay, it sounded a certain way, but then you give it to, to excellent musicians, and it's like, wow. I mean, I just look across the stage sometimes, like, wow, how cool, how and lucky. And your most recent, this live album that you've just put out, David Arkenstein and Friends, how did you, over time, like, how did you record it over the last couple of years? Like, mm -hmm. and yeah, and then how did you winnow those down in terms of performances? 
I don't know. We had like I had twenty four really good sounding tracks, and I, but I didn't want to make a double CD or anything. So I it was it was hard, you know. But there were different uh, there were different things about, and I wanted the album to show different sides of my music, and uh, different sides of the musicians, you know, something special. So that's that's what drove the selection of those songs. All right, I think I think we should open up for two questions from the audience. We I know we want to get you to play, but let's. Uh, I like playing. If we can bring the lights up a little bit, <clears throat> we'll take a couple questions and then we'll turn it over to the per performance. All right, I'm having a hard time seeing. Go ahead. I'm actually writing an opera about Atlantis now too. <laughs> That's taken forever. But uh, for the album, I just always loved that legend. Uh, and, then I, and then it was like coming up with a, uh, an arc of sort of a story and trying to paint the pictures of, of what I imagined Atlantis could be. And uh, I got a Grammy nomination, so, you know. <laughs> Thank you. After listening to your music for upwards of a decade on CDs throughout the city, I recently had an experience of actually getting to listen to some of your albums in the Red Forest in Northern California. Mm. And it really got me thinking, as much as your music is very clear because it is in the mind and the city environment, how has your personal relationship to travel or nature influenced your music making? Nature and travel are huge inspirations for me. I mean, I did one of my early nature inspired songs was a song called Yosemite when I was on Narada and I just love Yosemite and, and I just love traveling and it's my music is kind of a way for me to travel without going anywhere you know when the I don't have time or you know it's just like I like can't really go to the moon you know <laughs> whatever uh, so I travel through my music a lot of times and 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 I try to illustrate places I've been. You know, I've done a lot of records that are kind of uh, like Atlantis or Paris. Or it's like, oh, I, I like to visit these places. So I make some music that reminds me of these places. And I, I lived in the Redwoods outside of Santa Cruz for a while, and it was incredible. Another really quiet place. All right, we're going to do one more question. have one more? All right. I think we're ready. We're, we're going to take a few minutes to get set up here. So thank you, David, for being here. Thank you, Jason. You the time. Thank you. Thanks for coming. All right. We're going to get the stage set up, and then we'll resume here shortly.